understood your names, my first pursuit will be to to try to pick some names on some places for the next time. Uh, Lido, from comparative literature, E. Lido. Stato, K, from comparative literature. No, it's Stolt. Grandin, Rudenberg, Hogan, from comparative literature. Uh, Dominique Russell from Spanish. Uh, Simon, I suppose, Kang from French. Pierre Villeneuve. Lieber from English. Butler, J. Jeffries from English. Sanser in English, Warren in English, Rochester in English, uh, De Sante, Susan Warney from Western, Jennifer Henderson, York. James Ellis, New York. Jill Dido, Dido. Yankovic from French. <coughs> Rebecca Harris, okay. Murphy Noel, philosophy. Uh, Carody, is this Carody? Mm -hmm. And the only call, Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, Barbara Van Tigerstrom. Mm -hmm. uh, Josephine Pearson, literature. And Crispin. And, uh, Fraser. Okay. And Corinne uh, Re Renevé, Je sais plus trop. D'accord. Bien. Uh, I think we don't have very much time for discussion, and it is difficult to put notes uh, on your performances during the discussion because they are not very extensive. So I would like you to make some papers and to send them to Paris. And what kind of papers? Either you pick one of the points you have developed here and you try to restitute what we have said here and to develop some other more regional and more personal ideas. Either you pick another writer, say Baudelaire, and you try to develop an analogous analyst, an analysis on this other writer, as you like it. Uh, I think that... Uh, 10 or 15 pages will be enough because the lecture is not very long. Well, it is long, but it doesn't take a uh, very long time uh, during the, school, the, the university year. And my address is here uh, in the comparative department, so we can pick it up and send your papers to me. Are there questions on this point? No, okay. So I'll try now to... Uh, uh, Okay. In English. Yes, but uh, at the end of the semester. Yes, of course. December. I, I had to get them uh, January last yes, year. Yes, before. So, uh, before the because of Christmas holiday. Yeah. If you can send them for the Christmas holidays. Yes? You had a question? No. Uh, now, uh, uh, as I told you previously, uh, we shall try today to analyze this very famous piece in uh, Proustian text, which is uh, uh, 
called the episode of the Madeleine. Uh, and uh, every Proustian reader, and even those that have never read anything from, from Proust, have already been told about the existence of this famous Madeleine. So what it is about. Uh, as you have already noticed, this is not a very long text. And uh, I uh, divided it into seven stages. Uh, for me, the story uh, has uh, can be divided into seven successive stages, uh, which uh, uh, are encapsulated in the first few uh, in, in the last uh, excuse me few pages of Proust Ouverture. It's in the beginning of. Swan's Way, as you see, pages 46, 47, we're almost in the beginning of the, the book. And I shall go uh, through them in turn. Uh, I'll call the first stage just a luminous patch. Uh, maybe when I'm speaking about, you can try to read uh, quickly what is uh, the matter about. We start with the memory of uh, frustration and grief. I quote, the bare minimum of scenery necessary to the drama of my understanding. I find this in the first paragraph, page 47. As though there had been no time there but seven o'clock at night. Are you there? The two floors of uh, the, this uh, childish house, this house from the childhood, the two floors are reduced to a, quote, a sort of luminous patch. Uh, by the always untimely arrival of Mr. Swan, a, quote, the unwitting author of my sufferings. A guest will take the mother's attention. Uh, this is all that uh, the narrator remember from Combré and from his house, this uh, luminous patch, sort of luminous patch. The residue of Combré is dead to memory. All the rest is dead, he says. Uh, it can only be brought back again through the use of voluntary memory, <coughs> by the use of intellect. But as I already said tomorrow, the voluntary memory or the intellect are not interesting. <coughs> uh, which is as much as to say that this residue is without meaning. So the only meaning is this luminous patch that remains from the whole period of holidays on this house at Combre. Uh, what about this luminous patch? Rapidly forgotten, diluted in the cup of tea a la Madeleine, this patch will nonetheless be revived in a dramatic fun fashion in another volume of La Recherche, and precisely in La Prisonnière. And some of you maybe already know that there is a famous character from uh, La Prisonnière, Bergotte, who is the writer, another and uh, maybe the most important alter ego of the narrator. So Bergotte, the writer of La Recherche, in this uh, volume that's called La Prisonnière, rediscovers a little patch of yellow wool. So we find almost the same expression in the experience of Bergot as we find here in this uh, souvenir of uh, the childish experience. Bergot, the writer, rediscovers a little patch of yellow wool which he had forgotten about, in a painting by Vermeer, the uh, famous painter. 
praised by a critic as being, quote, like some priceless specimen of Chinese art, of a beauty that is sufficient in itself. It's volume 3187, if you want to go back to this uh, intertextual appearance of uh, the yellow patch in the text of Proust, but uh, in connection with another character. Uh, what happens when he discovers this little patch of yellow wall in Vermeer painting? The aridity and pointless, uh, pointlessness of art, says Bergot, non-excluding his own, are starkly revealed to Bergot in front of this masterpiece, which humiliates and bemuses him. So he be in front of this yellow patch of wall in Vermeer's painting, he is humiliated. And he says, my last books are too dry in comparison to this yellow patch. I ought to have gone over them with a few layers of color, made my language precious in itself, like this little patch of yellow wall. Either because of the indigestion he has caught from eating undercooked potatoes, or because the renewed effect of the little patch of yellow wall, Bergotte then collapses and dies. So you see that the effect of this yellow patch is very strong. He humiliates Bergotte and finally provokes his death. The narrator of A La Recherche, for his part, seems not to worry about the challenge of the other arts. And this is the meaning of this comparison between the yellow patch of Vermeer and uh, Bergotte. The other arts are better, they are more strong, their colors are more expressive, etc. And the effect of this comparison is that the writer does. But the narrator of La Recherche, for his part, seems not to worry about the challenge of the other arts. Proust's sentences compete with painting and music in their own terms. And the sequel to this story has shocks in thought for us, is in store for us, that put a little, the little patch to shame. And yet the idea of death, of a dead past, except for the luminous patch sharply defined against the vague and shadow background. The idea of death is already being brought up. And here it associates the disappearance of the ante Proust, represented by the writer Bergot, with the incapacity to bring a childhood memory to life again. So Bergot is a writer that is humiliated by painting, but he's also a writer that cannot get in touch with the childhood memory. And Proust will do this uh, in his own art, which can compete with the other arts, and who has this extraordinary uh, sense of uh, uh, expression, grammar, metaphor, that can capture even feelings and sensations. Uh, it is uh, precisely in the sequel of this episode that the death of the past will be repudiated and the whole flavor of childhood encapsulated with layers upon layers of sensations in a little cake. We go now to the second uh, stage of this episode that I will call the metamorphosis of the dead. Uh, you can go rapidly through uh, the passage and uh, we can see that uh, Proust refers to a belief according to which some souls of the dead, you see that you are still in connection with this problematic of death, death of Bergot, which is not explicitly referred to the death of the past. He says, I don't remember anything from my past except this patch of wall. And now he continues in the second stage, stage of my episode to uh, develop something about this uh, uh, problematic of death. Uh, so there is a belief 
that the souls of the dead becomes the captives of inferior beings, such as animals, plants, and inanimated objects, and survive within them in a completely changed and unrecognizable form. Might it not be the same for our own past, suggests the narrative. Tentatively, the hope of breathing new life into it is broached. It may be hidden, I quote, in some material object, in the sensation which the material object will give us. So the dead maybe doesn't disappear entirely. It may be infused in some material object, and more precisely, in the sensation which that material object would give us. For us, to come across it once again is just a matter of luck. Uh, we go now to the third stage, which begins with many years had uh, elapsed during which nothing had converted. And I'll call this third stage I have the luck to taste a Madeleine. One winter's day, says the writer, when uh, uh, the, the spirited narrator is persuading himself yet again that, quote, nothing of Cambrai save uh, what was comprised in the theater and drama of his going to bed there had any existence for him and the court. So in such a desperate situation, his mother offered him a cup of tea accompanied by, quote, one of those squat, plump little cakes called Petite Madeleine, which look as though they had been molded in the fluted valve of a scallop shell in the, the paragraph. In its unusual molded form, a kind of fungus born from a shell, the Madeleine stands between the narrator and his mother in the same way as Georges Sand's book François le Champy a few page, pages before. For the Madeleine scene is a sequel to a story which has already begun, we are on the page 48, and some pages before, we have not in the Xerox copies, but we can refer to them. Uh, there is another episode uh, in which immediately before our episode, the reading of François de Champy by the mother of the narrator, at this point a pampered child, forms a bound in voice and sensation between the future novelist and his progenitor, with no swan and no bedtime dramas to worry about, simply the two of them bathed in a tepid atmosphere, which is not yet tea time, but the redolent of a warm, wet kiss. Having left behind the dumb world of the mother's reading, we find it again in the underwater associations of the Madeleine, uh, their links with aquatic bivalves, bivalves and shellfish. But the, why this Madeleine in the first place? And why do we have to start by writing the word with a capital letter, as it is in the French text? I don't know if here they have no, they don't have it in the capital, but anyhow, the French text is with the capital. The first version of the text, which is in notebook 8 of the 1909 manuscript, merely refers to a dry biscuit. This is very strange because we have a biscuit instead of Madeleine, uh, une espèce de sèche biscotte à la place de la Madeleine. And when I... Uh, Across this in the manuscript, I, I was really struck why this uh, so prosaic biscuit and why had it changed into Madeleine. This is a real, maybe not very amazing for you, but very amazing for uh, the so-called literary geneticians 
a problem. So the term Madeleine appears only in draft 14, which consists of six pages cut out of a notebook without further identification, which had been paginated from one to nine and form the fair copy of a very densely worked out rough of notebook 25. Are these pages from an unidentified notebook, also from 1909, like notebook 29, or did Proust complete this fair copy at a later stage? This will be a question of literary genetic that were asked between other questions today. Did he perhaps put the fair copy in the 1909 notebook because of the similarity of content rather than because both belong to the same period of writing? We can leave the question open for the moment. I'll try to answer it a little bit later. But it is important since we have to, the exam to examine the motivations which led Proust to give the name Madeleine to the most significant confectionery in his book, and so to change Biscuit by Madeleine. Now let's uh, give some interpretation about uh, the uh, connotations of uh, the word Madeleine. The original reference of the name dates back, of course, to the well-known female singer of the Gospels, a woman from Magdala, hence Magdalena, Maudlin, St. Mary Maudlin. However, the common name of Madeleine was applied in the 17th century to the fruits sold around the season of St. Mary Madeleine, Madeleine, Madeleine peaches, St. Mary Madeleine. Uh, and uh, those fruits were at uh, the season peaches, plums, apples, and pears. And it continues its alimentary career in the 19th century by being used for cakes According to Becherel Dictionary, uh, this was a tribute to a cook called Madeleine Pommier. They did, uh, so there was a cook uh, prepared by uh, a famous cooker from the period, Madeleine Pommier, and uh, the cake was called because of her name, Madeleine Pommier. Even as it is, this evocative ancestry has enough to explain its interest for the writer. But given Proust's sustained attention to names, and you know that uh, the title place name, the name, is the title of the third section of Swan's Way, and there are several references that we'll have in the Xerox copies from Proust about the importance of proper names in his mind and literary work in general. So given Proust's sustained attention to names and his meticulous care in determining the choice of all the proper names of the characters in the novel, we might be justified in taking the inquiry further and asking what lurks behind the transformation of the prosaic biscuit into a name possessed by a female sinner, then by a saint, and finally by a common sweetmeat. I quote from uh, Proust, volume 3, 1012. He says the following, a name that very often is all that remains for us of a human being, not only when he is dead, but sometimes even in, in his lifetime. So the name is, for him, most important, even than the real person, not only when the person is dead, but sometimes even in his lifetime. Into the syllables of names, there gravitate sensations and pleasures which are capable of exciting our imagination and magnetizing our desire. For instance, Proust says that the name of Parma, the Italian city, is, I quote, compact, smooth, purplish, and sweet, 
because of its heavy syllable in which there is no air circulating and because of all the Stendhalian sweetness and reminiscence of violets which I have made it absorb. You see how a uh, sort of uh, dreaming uh, poetic connotation of re-semantization of the proper name is uh, used by uh, Proust in different other situations apart from this of the Madeleine. The same thing occurs with another proper name, for instance, Florence, for the uh, Italian city again. Florence has an embalming effect like the corolla of a flower because of being called the city of Lilis and its cathedral Santa Maria dei Fiori, St. Mary of the Flowers. Another example, Balbec, is of old Norman pottery, earth and colored, etc. Names cause the imagination to crystallize. They pose a magic within themselves. Again, a quote from volume two, page five. Sometimes, hidden in the heart of its name, the fairy is transformed to suit the life of our imagination by which she lives. However, the fairy languishes if we come into contact with the real person to whom her name corresponds. So the fairy is uh, precisely in the name and not in the real person. Uh, this is again the importance of uh, what is symbolic, what is imaginary, uh, is more important for Proust than uh, the real uh, things and persons. So, what fairy is hiding under the proper name of Madeleine, and even more tucked away under the common name for the confectionery? Repeating the same sounds, using the identical syllables over again, gives us a quote, a sensation from a bygone ear, and enables us to gauge the distance between the dreaming states that have been marked each in their turn by these identical tones. So a noble name becomes like, uh, says Proust again in another uh, text, we don't have it here, uh, the noble name becomes like a balloon filled with oxygen. You only have to burst it and by this act of mischief, which is quite childish after all, you let out the air of Combray, the scent of the hawthorn blossom is OBP, the rain, the sunshine, and the sacristy. Childhood is indeed, I quote, the age when names offer us an image of the unknowable, which is laid down by the reality of people and things, but can be happily recovered by the memory underneath the sound which once entranced the child's ear. This is a type of reasoning which works for geographical names, like Bayeux, Vitré, Constance, Lagnon, Quimperlé, Pontouzon, etc. Uh, as it does for the prestigious name of Guermantes. But will it perhaps work in other cases? The answer lies in using the same sounds once again and in manipulating them even to the point of destroying or bursting the proper name so that it loses its uh, uncommon nature, while at the same time it releases through the oxygen of memory the plethora of sensations, impressions, and delights, I quote, in which we suddenly feel the original entity quiver and resume its form, carve itself into a syllable now death. Here, in order to understand better uh, what kind of Madeleine is hidden behind this common name, here the text is in need of an intertext. The narrator's grandmother, and I will give two intertexts. The first one is the following. The narrator's grandmother, a great admirer of Georges Sand, had made him a present of the four pastoral novels of the well-known author. Uh, those four pastoral novels are La Mare au Diable, François Le Chanty, precisely, 
uh, la petite fadette and le maître sonneur. My dear, she had said to Mama, it's uh, some pages before the episode, I could not bring myself to give the child anything that was not well written. In this way, reading from Georges Sand come to form a special link between the son and his mother. In the earlier versions of the text, Proust speaks simply of a volume by Georges Sand referring to La Mare au Diable. In his notebooks 8 and 10, however, two texts get mentioned, La Mare au Diable and François le Champi. The mother is still shown as reading two of Georges Sand's texts up to the typewritten manuscript destined for the Figaro, usually dated 1909, in which Proust finally crosses out La Mare au Diable. François Le Champy is left Champy, Champignon, uh, and Madeleine. François Le Champy is left on its own in the bedtime episode, which precedes that of the Madeleine. Let's pass. What, what's about this uh, François Le Champy text? I suppose that you don't know anything about uh, it, and it was my case before preparing this lecture, so I went to see what is about in this François Le Champy text, and it's really uh, very interesting. Less pastoral than the other three novels, François Le Champy, which is written in 1850, uh, sorry, 1850, tells the story of a foundling child. Champy is the term for foundling in the Berry dialect, who is taken in by the miller's wife and the name of the miller's wife is Madeleine Blanchet. So this uh, Madeleine Blanchet uh, that found uh, François de Champy uh, became the object of uh, a love from uh, the part of the child. Uh, and in the same time, the child becomes the object of her unwitting love. The latter, in his return on the village, the child in his return in the village, as an adult, becomes the lover and the husband of his adoptive mother, who has uh, by then become a widow. So François de Champy is a novel about incest. The child is found, the child is in love with his mother, adopted mother, the mother is in love with him, and when he comes back years after, uh, he marries his mother. Proust was to be a severe critic of Georges Sand in his latter writings. He says that Georges Sand has a very bad style, she cannot use metaphors, etc. But he nevertheless retained this central reference to François de Champy, and this is very important, because what he retains is not Georges Sand, but the, the incestuous episode. So he retained this uh, central reference to François de Champy, Champy with its reading continuing uh, to play a structural role in the scaffolding of uh, La Recherche. Even in Time Regained, which is the last part of the book, it gets a reference when the narrator is in the library of the Prince de Guermont, and this pastoral volume of uh, uh, Georges Sand provokes the fourth and the most, most important of his reminiscences and leads to his aesthetic revelation. So this François Le Champy appears twice in very crucial points in the novel. There is therefore good reason to think it is precisely the theme of incest, the sinning mother, that secured and maintained Proust's interest in François de Champy, however much he may have disapproved of George Sand's style. The role of the Miller's wife, Madeleine Blanchet, would be one of communicating through her uh, flowery witness the taste of forbidden love that will find its way into the narrator's main aesthetic credo, a taste which had been metamorphosed into an apparently anodyne object, a little Madeleine. Yet, in reading the various versions of the text, 
one is struck by two small facts which throw an interesting light on Proust and the genesis of his writing. The first fact has to do with the appearance and later the disappearance of Madeleine Blanchet's name in the text. In the first typewritten version, which has already been mentioned, after uh, this predisposed me to imagine that Francois Le Champy contains something inexpressibly delicious, Proust writes, the opening pages are very simple. Madeleine Blanchet, the miller's wife of Cormoner, discovers in her field a child who is playing in front of the fountain where she washes her linen. But the fact that this country woman, this small child, this fountain in this field formed part of a novel gave them an extraordinary attraction in my eyes. And then I felt that this meeting between the miller's wife and the child was something more than what appeared to be, that it would later become important for the life of the characters, that it was not just a detached episode, but a beginning which reached towards an unknown future." End of the quote, of this notebook. But this passage, which appears in notebook 10 originally, and as a fairy copy in the typescript, is left out of the subsequent versions. Madeleine Blanchet is retained at the first proof stage, but she is omitted from the printed text based on the corrected proofs, as well as from the third stage of the proofs. This uh, devastating elimination took place within a month, and obviously there must have been an intermediate text which is now missing between the two manuscripts, where Proust would have crossed out in his own hand the passage concerning <coughs> Madeleine Blanchet. We can only conclude that he had thought about the matter beforehand and already taken the decision in his mind to expel the Miller's wife from the text because she had no further role to play there. But why? Why he had eliminated Madeleine Blanchet that is so in a strong and erotic connection with his uh, Madeleine, his uh, cookie. It is just going too far to speak of, of an incestuous murder before dealing with sweet meat. Or did the peasant love story no longer seem quite up to the level of Proustian aesthetic and sensual ambitions that Proust describes as, I quote, unwholesome as uh, sweets and cakes. What was the reason for Madeleine, Madeleine Blanchet's disappearance? And at what stage, precisely, did it take place? This is, again, a question from literary genetics. Here we have a second fact. I mentioned that uh, I'll refer to two facts in the intertextual uh, dynamic of the Proustian episode. And the second fact, fact to take into account in determining how this part of the novel came to take the form that it did is the following. Uh, on the 1st of March, 1896, the literary review called La Vie Contemporaine published a novella entitled L'Indifférent, the Indifferent, under the signature of Marcel Proust, and which remained unknown to the literary public until it was re-edited only in 1978, so very recently, by Philippe Kolb. It is not irrelevant to mention how Kolb himself came upon this youthful text by Proust. In a letter dating from 1910 to his friend Robert de Flair, Proust inquires if, uh, uh, he has, if he has, if he, uh, Robert de Flair, has in his possession a copy of La Vie Contemporaine, this literary review they have edited when they were younger. Because Proust has misled his own copy and because he needs one. 
and he writes to Robert de Fleur, I wrote a silly novella there, which I am now in need of, and you would do me a service if you could send me the number. What goes on in this silly novella? Uh, and here it's again a text uh, that you don't know, I suppose, and uh, I didn't know also. So I get back to the novella and I found something very interesting in connection with our Madeleine again. Uh, this is the plot of this silly novella. A noble lady falls in love with a young man who shows nothing but indifference, and that's why the novella is called indifferent, towards her. Increasingly attracted by this personage who bears the surname indifferent, featured in a famous painting by Watteau, she ends by finding out that this young man, this indifferent man called Le Pré, uh, that this young Le Pré's coldness is a cover for his passionate attachment to prostitutes. And here we find the theme of profanation I called yesterday. I quote this silly novel called uh, The Indifferent. He loves the ignoble women who are found in the gutter and he loves them to destruction. End of the quote. The connection between this plot and the love life of Swan is a plausible one. And Philip Kolb, the editor again of Proustian Correspondence and one of the best uh, specialists on Proust, Philip Kolb so demonstrates very convincingly uh, the link between this novel and Swan and Odette, on the other hand. In fact, Swann is a lover of a tart, Odette de Crecy, whom he rescues from the street and prepares for a brilliant career, one that will be difficult at first, but in the end crowned with worldly success, all the more so after her husband has died and society has altered as a result of the war. Odette could be seen as an amalgam of the bursting the proper name in order to make the common name, oh, sorry, an amalgam of uh, a woman loved by Le Pré and a noble lady uh, to whom uh, he is entirely indifferent, a high and mighty aristocrat whose prototype may well have been uh, the Comtesse Griffule. Uh, she was covered like uh, this uh, uh, noble lady from the indifferent. She was covered in flowers without a single jewel, says the text. Her corsage of yellow too, covered with cattleyas. The cattle were some flowers that Odette de Crécy, uh, the character of Proust, used to um, cherish very much. And she has also attached a few cattleyas in her dark coiffure. These cattleyas later become a fetish word of Odette and Swan. To do a catleia, uh, being the most intimate term in their private language, uh, meaning to make love. So uh, there is a strong connection between this novella, The Indifferent, and the Odette and Swan episode, uh, particularly through uh, this image of the uh, famous flowers, the catleias. Uh, so we can say that an essential aspect of the hearing of uh, l'indifférent has therefore been incorporated in the character of Odette in an inverted form because uh, the hearing of the indifferent is an irreproachable grand dame, uh, while uh, Odette is the very opposite, an ignoble creature. Uh, and uh, in this uh, sense, we can say that the irreproachable grand dame, at the very opposite end of the scale from the ignoble creatures who stimulate uh, Le Pré to vice, lends her floral charm to Odette, a process of transference which ennobles the demi mondaine and profanes the aristocrat. It is easy to understand that in creating Swan and his love life, Proust needed to go back to the heroine of L'Indifferent, 
this novel that he had written when, when he was young, and whom he had certainly not forgotten, but wished to study again in detail. Yet it happens that the commentators who see her living again in Odette have forgotten to mention the name of the high and mighty dame. She is called Madeleine, Madeleine de Gouvre. So, Odette has robbed her of her cherished flower, the Cattleyas. But Madeleine de Gouvre retains her nobility and toughness, putting us in mind of an inaccessible presence which is familiar but forbidden, familial and lofty and lofty at the same time, the very image of a loved mother who is cut off from us by a patch of light and drama. The image of Madeleine de Gouvre will not go away. As with the superstition which the narrative mentions in the second stage of our episode, Dead souls can be incorporated in inanimated objects, as he says. In particular, perhaps, if the identical sonorities, Madeleine de Gouvre and the cookie called Madeleine, if the identical sonorities and timbres of the names pronounced in the course of repeated dreaming and feeling revive and reanimate the remote presence of the fairies and their abouts. Madeleine will easily succeed in ousting the unfortunate rust and in granting her maternal flavor, which is at the same time blandly inaccessible and delightfully exciting, to a little Madeleine, which lurks tasteless in my mouth, but also has the power to arouse desire without end. So the narrator will easily rediscover the forbidden pleasure of the mother's kiss, whose melancholy charms he had just recounted to us at the moment when Swan's arrival obliged him as a dutiful son to give it up and go to bed. So he will uh, find again the mother's kiss, not in the mother's mouth, or even in her voice as she reads François Le Champy, but in a stumpy, fat little fungus dunked in the tea and named inevitably a Madeleine, like Madeleine Blanchet and Madeleine de Gouvre. You might be right in seeing my determination to resurrect Madeleine Blanchet and Madeleine de Gouvre in this famous piece of confectionery as the fantasy of a mischievous or well-informed reader. I persist in it because, for one thing, Proust is no stranger to this kind of ironic but also tender transposition. And for another, the Madeleine episode, framed as it is by the memory of the mother rejected because she does not offer herself and by the story of Swan, this episode serves as a special invitation to us to reinstate the oral link which binds the narrator to a woman he loves who is yet capable of remaining indifferent to him. As if Proust was the same, so you refuse to offer to yourself, mother? Who does it matter? In any case, that pleasure means nothing to me. I will soon, or it will soon mean nothing. I have other ones which are not necessarily ignoble, like the pleasures of Le Pre, but really subtle and indefinable, going far beyond François Le Champy, your readings and your kisses. A cup of tea will do, and another woman, a paternal aunt, Aunt Leonie, that will find further, who is more distant and reassuring, standing in your place. She will not let your intrusive closeness work its effect 
and count me and count my beverage like those Japanese paper that we'll find also in the last part of the text. No, all I can taste is an indifferent Madeleine, the deferred recollection of another thing, of another woman, a woman you could have been or have been but are no longer. I can guarantee that Odette has observed the desirable situation. All we have is the polite indifference of a cup of tea and my imaginings in secret. So it can be claimed that Madeleine de Gouvre lives a double life from now on. She's a silly specter, all right. But uh, she does not live Proust's imaginary life indifferent. She is not like a mother who abandons you. She is a woman you drop like Le Pré drops her, because she is all too worthy and you prefer the unworthy ones. Who is it that makes this choice? Le Pré? Swann obviously does, for he prefers Odette to her but only when he has ennobled Odette, adjusting her in the light of elegance and artistic inspiration, grafting the cat layers onto her. The narrator himself is not inacquainted with Swann's adventures. After Gilbert, uh, which is Swann's daughter, his choice will settle upon uh, the barely presentable Albertine, who is a long way from gaining the approval of his respectable mother. Desire abases its object in order to get to it more effectively. Proust himself will push this principle to its absolute limit by placing, I spoke about that yesterday, his family furniture and photographs on show in the Prado. Yet this logic of profanation of abasement is supported by another one, which it needs to consolidate in order to do away with it conclusively. It is a question of holding on at any price to the pure and candid flavor, like an afternoon tea with cakes, the flavor of the sensations aroused by the mother's presence of divesting it of its female sexuality, of its female corporeality, leaving behind nothing but a tender, loving care. Mary Maudlin has to be made a saint, but in a different way from the Gospels. The arousing aspect of womanhood, of motherhood, sets into inaccessibility in l'indifférent. Yet at the same time, it is destined to recover a modest level of strength in this exquisite satisfaction, which is oral by origin, and completely satisfies the son's recollection by causing a whole garment of sensations to cluster around the name of a cake as woman and bring the house of his birth to life again. At the same period, 1909-1910, Proust invents a female character whom he will later abandon in favor of Albertine. And this uh, female character is also in connection with uh, Mary Maudlin. She is called Maria, a young girl who excites the narrator's interest but later disappoints him. Maria is obviously linked to Maudlin. She said phrase Mary Maud, uh, the set phrase Mary Maudlin means a female sinner. However, Proust's tentative Maria is no more than a mediating device to conceal and contain his passion for uh, the chauffeur Agostinelli. Albertine will be the definitive character charged with this role. Uh, Marie Madeleine, nonetheless, makes her return as such when the writer turns his attention to the Germans' way, and this time in connection with uh, Robert de saint loup and his love for Rachel. So you see that in the text of Proust, 
there are several uh, uh, references to Marie Madeleine here in connection with Robert de Senlo, and it's quite interesting. Whilst the actress Rachel, uh, which is the lover of uh, uh, Senlo, while this actress leaves the narrative completely indifferent, Saint Lou is bowed over by her. He is foolish enough to make a girl into an inaccessible idol, says the writer. The paths of lover and those who remain unmoved cannot in any way be reconciled. I quote, it is not that I thought Rachel, when from the Lord, to be of little account, but that I recognize the power of the human imagination. So a person is considered to be uh, important, you can love it, if this person is illuminated by the human imagination, says Proust. It is not the fact of the narrator. For him, Rachel was not arising any imagination. For uh, saint Lou, I think is different. Uh, he was uh, putting a lot of imagination precisely in Rachel. So the narrator, for his part, can see the surrounding bushes as gods, whilst in the gospel, Mary Maudlin mistook the man of passion for a mere indifferent gardener. She recalls the entirely social misconception which led Maudlin and Madeleine in L'Indifférent not to discover the passion of Lepre, as well as Lepre's own blindness which made him incapable of responding to Madeleine de Gouvre beauty since he did not love her. However, in the gospel, Mary Maudlin's bemusement is only temporary. She soon guesses that Jesus is present, that he has revealed to her the passion of his own flesh in order to assuage her grief. In this way, we can see that saints as a double for the narrator himself. The saint has an imagination. She discovered Christ in the God, in the simple person, in the peasant, because her imagination, because her faith uh, helped her. And in this sense, the saint is a double for the narrator himself, who sees gods in uh, some uh, uh, trees and uh, stones around, surrounding him. He has known of the lover's imagination, which brings Saint Lou to adore the prostitute. But he is destined to recover the delusory enthusiasm of the lover's imagination with Albertine. She, in fact, will exercise an enigmatic charm on the young man, which uh, his friend failed to comprehend, and which is presented as the exact counterweight to Saint Lou's infatuation with Rachel. Uh, so the conclusion is that love alone and love as imagination has the capacity to create metaphors and infuse the experience of time into images as it does into objects and names. It is love as an equivalent of imagination that makes a rusk into a cascade of involuntary memories sweet realization of the lost sensation that can be formulated once again. Let us not finally, as a provisional conclusion to this metaphorical and uh, metaminical uh, series of Madeleine uh, and Mary Maudlin's, uh, that the princess of Germont, the proud but not very dressy and teutonically stuck up cousin of the in inaccessible Oriane, has the Christian name of Mary. So we found again an allusion of Mary Maudlin in The Princess of Germain. This is the Mary Marie Gilbert, whom in her aquarium box at the opera, Proust dressed in the way that Madame Standish did in reality. However strange and distant, she is perhaps not indifferent under the load of her toilette. It is, however, the Duchess of Guermont, who perpetuates in a La Recherche the aesthetic and aristocratic prestige that the Comtesse Griffith inspired.
is almost sublime, even though she will eventually be plunged into a ridicule reminiscent of Madame Verduren after the war and the Dreyfus affair, which leave no one unscathed. For the moment, though, we have been looking at uh, uh, Madeleine as a common name and Madeleine as a proper name, the woman and the sweetmeat, the mother and the sinner, the one tasty and the one indifferent. Metaphor and metonymy succeed in irradiating the text, bringing places and moments together under the auspices of desire and condensing their intermittent appearances into a pure form of oral sensuousness. This is the nodal point of childhood memory, with the book, the voice, and the taste coming together in fusion, with Aunt Leonie giving Mama a hand in order that a loving body can emerge from the cup of tea. We shall find Aunt Leonie a little bit later. This has been there from childhood. In her own way, Madeleine de Gourre demonstrates the fact in 1896, when uh, Proust published this uh, silly novel called L'Indifférent, and uh, where Madeleine de Gourre appears as the principal, uh, the main character. The narrator must have unconsciously associated her with the ambiguity of his desires when he replaced the rusk with a Madeleine, the biscuit with the Madeleine in 1909. He re, his rereading in 1910, when he asked Robert de Flair to send him his novella, and when he uh, reread it, uh, because of this Robert de Flair's uh, present, must obviously have confirmed him in his choice. The fair copy of the unidentifiable sweets dates perhaps from this rereading and so from 1910. So this is maybe a suggestion to uh, consider that the, uh, the replacement of the biscuit by uh, the Madeleine uh, occurs in 1910 when he goes back to his novella The Indifferent, sent by Robert de Flair. In any case, Madeleine as a common name and Madeleine as a proper name was already inscribed in his memory and in the, task, in the text as a crossroad of flavors, women, sin, indifference, and more or less sacred books which has not yet lost its power to make a dream. Now, uh, after this very long intertextual uh, travel through different aspects of the proper name Madeleine, let's go to the text. And we will be on the fourth stage, which is page 48. And uh, I'll call it an exquisite pleasure without origin. You can go through the text quickly and we'll find this uh, uh, description of the pleasure uh, caused by uh, the sweet. An exquisite pleasure had invited my senses, something isolated, detached, with no suggestion of its origin. It's a little bit, three lines uh, beneath the number four. So let's return to the story. Softened in the tea, the mouthful of cake touches the palate, and this contact, which is the most infantile and archaic that a living being can possibly experience with an object or a person, because it's a contact with the mouth, since food, like air, is the exquisite necessity which keeps us alive and curious about our fellows. So this contact sets off I call an extraordinary process in me. It's some lines uh, down. To be honest, it is a pleasurable sensation. And Proust writes, an exquisite pleasure had invaded my senses 
something isolated, detached, with no suggestion of its origin. Why no suggestion of its origin? Because the origin remains behind in the salon, the origin refuses to kiss or read, the origin is a noble lady who believes her son to be indifferent without suspecting, though she may already have had a presentment of the fact, that indifference uh, is fostered by vice. The origin has became, become infused in the Madeleine without anyone being the wiser. To recollect uh, through the senses is just the same as being in love. Together, these features form the essence of the narrator. And so his selves can be directly equated with his recollections of love and thus of sex sensory experience, which place him right at the opposite side of the scale from the humdrum accidents of everyday reality. I quote, and at once the vicissitudes of life had become indifferent at me. It's a little bit after the origin. At once the vicissitudes of life had become indifferent to me. This new sensation having had on me the effect which love has of filling me with the precious essence. So sensory experience is the equivalent of love. Here he says this very explicitly. Or rather this essence was not in me, it was me. I had ceased now to feel mediocre, contingent, and mortal. Let's stress to this final sentence. I cease now to feel mediocre, contingent, and mortal. This means that this recollection, which partakes at the same time of love and of sensation, can be seen from now on as the vanquishing of a depressive stage. I have ceased to feel mediocre. I have been depressed, but now I'm not. I have vanquished this uh, uh, feeling of being mediocre, contingent, and mortal. So, uh, this recollection, which partakes at the same time of love and of cessation, can be seen from now on as the vanquishing of a depressive stage, a vanquishing which still remains enigmatic, because Proust writes, whence could it have come to me, this all-powerful joy? So after mediocre, contingent, mortal, there is a joy, but it's enigmatic. Whence could it have come to me? Proust raises the issue even in these opening pages, of the naturalness of sensation. The sensation is not natural. We have to ask what is the sense of it? When does it come? Since taste is a taste for tea and cakes, it is unquestionably rooted in the things of the world. So sensation is dependent on the things. Taste is of the world in just the same way as the experience which restores both taste and all the other forms of cessation. And yet, at the same time, the narrator is convinced that the experience has, I quote, infinitely transcended taste and sensation. It, I quote, could not indeed be of the same nature. So what he experienced is rooted in the things, in the nature, but is not the same. Right from that start, in fact, this joy born of experience is a meaningful one. It's not a natural one. The joy comes from the nature but it's not identified with the nature, it's a meaningful one. And uh, we find the sign of this fact that the joy is meaningful in the question, what did it mean 
us in the narrative. The sensation is not natural. It means, it has a meaning. What did it mean? In order to answer this question, he will have a second taste of this same Madeleine. The second mouthful produces nothing more uh, than was in the first. The third is even less strong if you go down to the textual foundations. Sensation as such is ebbing away. I quote, the potion is losing its magic. It is plain that the truth I am seeking lies not in the cup, but in myself. So the sensation is originated by the cup, but its uh, main characteristics are not in the cup, are not in the nature, are not in the outside object. They are in the meaning which is in myself. It only remains for the narrator to abandon the cup and address himself to the mind, he says the mind, the esprit in the French text. The mind, however, is in a state of feeling overtaken, for it is just not a matter of searching through it to locate an experience which was formerly led down there in the same form. You have to create the experience. So the experience is not in the mind. It's not uh, just uh, mainly and roughly in the mind. We have to recreate it. I quote, seek more than that, create. It is face to face with something which does not yet exist, to which it alone can give reality and substance which it alone can bring into the light of day. So the joy, the sensation, doesn't exist naturally. It's in my mind, but it's not in my mind in a plain or natural way. I have to recreate the experience. I don't have even to seek it as if it has already been deposited there. I have to create, à la recherche, some uh, means uh, to recreate in the search for means in this particular uh, part of the text means a poiesis, a recreation, a, a new creation, a poetic work. And this is very uh, clearly uh, expressed in the final text uh, I have uh, of this fourth uh, stage. I have to find the sensation in my mind but it's not already done, already deposited there. It's not a matter of seeking, of searching. Uh, on the search for the time, it's uh, in fact a creating of the time and the creating of the experience in the same time, the creating of the sensation. Here we go to the fifth stage, which I'll call the desire and the visible. Uh, You'll find an essential uh, sentence in this stage. I'll quote it firstly. I do know, no, I don't know yet what it is, but I can feel it mounting slowly. And this is uh, a very strong expression of the desire. I don't know yet what it is, but I can feel it mounting slowly. The proof of this happiness is an imponderable which escapes all categories of logic, says Proust initially. The narrator will make an effort, nonetheless, to clarify the experience that he feels. And how? By, first of all, insulating himself from all his present sensations, especially those of hearing. He will stop his ears and concentrate hard. But no. If you follow the text, you shall see that uh, this uh, first experience to isolate himself from the surrounding sensation, it is too rigorous and tiring. A better idea would be to cultivate, he says, a state of distraction, to clear an empty space, a sort of Buddhist experience, to, 
to, to create an empty space in myself. Uh, so uh, the still recent sensation of taste becomes combined with what we must uh, really call desire as a lively erotic impulse makes itself felt. I quote, I feel something start within me, something that leaves its resting place and attempts to rise, something that has been embedded like an anchor at a great deep. I can feel it mounting slowly. And this is, I think, a very, very precise description of the desire as it uh, comes up and up in the body. Distance and resistance are overcome. And what is there? First, uh, Proust tried to describe this uh, uh, desire that is mounting, that is raising, as an image. Taste has become a representation. I quote, an elusive whirling medley of stirred up colors, something visible. Here indeed we have, I quote, a form in gestation which remains nevertheless confused the word form and confused are used by Proust, and is incapable of translating, also he says, uh, incapable of translating clearly. It's inseparable paramour, which is the, the taste. So there is something visible that occurs, but it's in this stage confused, and we cannot separate it from the taste. This is a wonderful moment of uh, Proust as a philosopher, I shall say, or semiotician, when he tries to distinguish feeling, image, and word. Sensation, taste, representation, colors, forms, and uh, signs that he uses in order to describe them. It is a wonderful moment when the image mounts under the impulsion of desire. A moment to repeat, he says, but uh, then to leave behind. A moment which is disturbing. It's a very strong moment. A vertiginous was, he says. It's a difficult task, this is in the test, to confront the narrator with. We cannot in passing, how sensation and representation inevitably drift apart at the very moment when the experience of taste as an immediate perceptual experience is transcended by the concern to illuminate its meaning. Taste and vision are still inseparable paramours, but they have come unstuck. This is a fundamental lack of fit between what is perceived and what is signified, which the world is called upon to resolve. There is a sort of gap between the perception and the signification, the perceived and the meaningful. And this gap uh, brings a sort of vertigo, a, a very strong moment of uh, uh, disturbance in the writer's mind. And the work is called upon to resolve this abyss. If only, he says, the cowardice of boredom and desire did not distract the narrator from this task. But this is the essential origin of the imaginary work this uh, uh, abyss, this lack of fit between the perceived and the signified. And it is a very subtle moment when Proust observes these uh, different stages of the perceived, the desirable, and the nameable. And the whole process of writing will be to follow these stages and to make us go through them. Now you go to the sixth stage, which I called a substitution quietens the effervescence. 
Aunt Leonie instead of Mum. Uh, well, after this disturbing and very subtle vertigo moment, we have another stage which begins, begins with the world and suddenly, and suddenly memory comes. We are not in the present moment, which was a disturbing sexual with this metaphor of erection, something is rising in my body, etc., which is really very phallic in a sense. And suddenly, memory offers a substitution which will finally provide a stable image, because till now the image was not stable, it was confused, you remember. It was filled with uh, taste, with uh, uh, desire with uh, uh, vertigo and so on. Now the image will become stable. Suddenly memory offers a substitution which will finally provide a stable image for the unconvulsive and effervescence of the narrator's identity. And for this gap that I already mentioned between what is perceived and what is signified. For Mummy's Madeleine, there is substituted the Madeleine of Leonie, the father's sister, around whom Proust arranges his memories of his paternal family, the family of Amiot uh, from Illier. There is a, a metonymic shift from mother to aunt, from present to past sensation. And you see how this metonymy stabilizes Proustian, uh, I'll not say any more met metaphor, but metamorphosis, because you are convinced, I suppose, of the presence of sensations and even sexual desire in this metaphor of the Madeleine. So it will be stab stabilized, this metaphor, metaphor, metamorphosis, by the means of uh, a uh, metonymic shift that will uh, change the figure of the mother into the figure of the aunt and the situation in the past into a situation uh, of the present into a situation in the past. So I repeat, there is a metonymic shift from mother to aunt, from present to past sensation. The flavor of the past still slumbering in the depth of the memory which had been thought quite wrongly to have disappeared, came back, because you remember that in the first stage he said everything of my memory had disappeared. Now everything had not disappeared. Some aspect of the past come back, and particularly the image of Aunt Leonie. <coughs> so uh, these aspects come back again to endow with image and body the mounting sense of vertigo which the narrator is troubled by in the preceding paragraph. Take note of the process, which is the following. Actual experience, the mother's Madeleine, is imbued with a disabling intensity and gives rise to states of emptiness and confusion, which, which would be ungovernable if the narrator were not able to stabilize his pleasure through a displacement, the distance in time and space. He will refer to Sunday before mass with his aunt. So this distance, time and space, affords a perception and an image which are analogous to what is experienced now, and without them, the present experience would fall to pieces. So this analogy that stabilizes the uh, actual experience, which is very troublesome, is found through the metonymy that makes us reach something else, another space, Sunday before Mass, another time, and another person, Aunt Leonie. This process of metonymic transfer which opens up the domain of the past is the construction of a metaphor. You see now how metonymy takes 
an important part in the construction of the Proustian metaphor because it has the goal to stabilize the metaphor. Without this metonymy, the metaphor is a vertigo, it's a desire, is an erection, it's emptiness, is this taste that makes me empty. So intrusive is this first maternal, sinner, and more modern metaphor that initially represents the Madeleine. So we need a second aspect, this met metonymic shift, in order to build in the reality of the signs and not only in hallucination the metaphorical experience. The metonymy is necessary in order to transform the hallucination and the sensation, the feeling as hallucination, into a verbal sign. I will repeat this process of metonymic transfer, which opens up the domain of the past, is the construction of a metaphor. Proust's Madeleine is thus the condensation which embraces two moments in time and two different spaces within what we call, in the same text, the vast structure of recollection. And now we'll reach uh, the uh, seventh stage, which I'll call memory is a cascade of spatial metaphors. Uh, this point of equilibrium generates a chain of memories. You remember that in the beginning there was not from the uh, old memory just this patch of wall with the recollection of death, Bergot, etc. But on the point when we are, this point of equilibrium done through uh, the peaceful influence of Aunt Leonie, we have a sort of generation of chain of memories, which is at the same time a cascade of spatial metaphors. Uh, we can find here the pleasure of taste that is given full reign in the happy atmosphere of the dwellings of his childhood. The old great house is described in the last paragraph, the town square, the country roads in the vicinity, the flowers in the garden, all that has been empty in the first paragraph now is present. The swan's park, the water lilies of the Vivonne, the good folk of the village and the church of Combray. Always in this last paragraph. The modest patch of luminous wall is forgotten, swept away of the way by the proliferation of cherished spaces. All becomes, I quote, solid and recognizable. We're not in this fuzzy situation in the beginning. Everything is due to the metaphor that is uh, stabilized through the metonymy. Everything is solid and recognizable. Since an interval has been inserted between, on the one hand, the oral collapse in the mother's proximity, which stirs up desires founded upon the preferred readings and the often withheld kisses, and on the other hand, the stability of Aunt Leonie, who is set at a safe distance. It is her sickly, bourgeois, and already a little ridiculous presence, Proust always described, describes her with a sort of irony. So it is this, his, uh, her, this uh, Aunt uh, Leonie, uh, ridiculous presence that will provide the focus for the observation of Combray. And there is one final metonymy of uh, the Madeleine, that of the magic Japanese scraps of paper, they are in the last uh, lines of the text, which take, on their take, which take on their form once they have been steeped in bowls filled with water. It is the definitive stabilization of the loss and transference of meaning and representation whose story is recounted to us in the episode of the Madeleine. 
So if I have to resume, I shall say that we have Aunt Leonie after Mummy and Japan after Aunt Leonie. We are at the very antipodes of the place of birth in the foreign country, as if it was necessary to set up a maximum distance, a foreign country, to enable us to see how evanescent, again to the maximum extent, is the object of desire which the little Madeleine offers us to be sensed. So in order to transform what is, sen what is sensed into a visible, into a visible sign which is closer to the linguistic sign, we need a maximum distance. And Japan is the metaphor of this maximum distance. Both elsewhere and here, it's Mami and Japan. Past and present, a sensation and image at the same time, just, just as it is both a name and meaning, our Madeleine is built from all of this and excites a taste for one as much for the other. Mummy was a startling mechanism which is henceforth indifferent to us. We had forgotten her, as is Madeleine de Gouve. Now we are within the imaginary world of the Madeleine. But is this imaginary indifferent in its turn? I don't think so. It is just secret, and the whole novel will be a search for this sweet, as well for this ignoble aspects of the sensual, erotic secrets. Thank you. <coughs> now I think we shall have a wait. A wait and a break. All to the same, I think contingent, mortal, and mediocre go to the same context of, of depreciative uh, evaluation of, of himself. It seems exactly the same. It, it seems that he doesn't have any value. He will die, he is not worthy to live. He, he is uh, in a state of, uh, of transition um, life, contingent without any uh, rigid or strict or whatever valuable value, I can say. Uh, I think all oh, the three epithets express the same uh, depressive state in my mind. I, I don't know if the biscuit goes in the same sense, maybe. Uh, and when he tried to overwhelm this uh, uh, present position, he, he took up another, um, another suite, which is more, uh, more Catholic in a sense. Because, well, when I said to Professor um, Metzler, uh, there are several other connotations of this Madeleine that I wasn't able to give in the lecture because they are too much. Uh, but uh, uh, the one is that uh, L'Église de la Madeleine, which is a big uh, uh, monument in, in France, was, uh, uh, it was possible to see it from uh, the windows of his house. So it was in front of, of La Madeleine. And also these biscuits uh, called Madeleine uh, were very famous in Combray, uh, what he calls Combray, his father's family uh, country house in Ivier, where people uh, pass through in order to go to Saint Jacques de Compostelle, uh, the pilgrims. And Saint Jacques de Compostelle has as uh, um, uh, an image um, La Coquille Saint Jacques, which is uh, the, the same uh, 
شيء where the Madlen are involved. So uh, uh, there is a religious, uh, uh, or in a sense, a resurrective sense in this uh, Madlen uh, taste also, which goes as a, as a counterpoint, if you want, to, to the uh, situation of uh, depression that you refer to. I found it really fascinating the amount that you played on the work of the imagination. Yeah. And I wonder, because the output you do a retrospection based on the principle of the citizens of excuse, the politics, the faith, and the civil rights, and the economic community. And I was all the time reminded that the chance to give which is a word on the imagination, from far in the development, and you can't do an interest in the construction. Well, I, uh, I have to say, I, in a sense, I, uh, I, I'm involved, I'm uh, uh, filtered with the Kantian reading, but it was not a conscious utilization. It's, uh, I never referred consciously to this. But, uh, maybe, in a sense, I would say that this uh, uh, affiliation between uh, this uh, Kantian dichotomies from the one hand and the structuralism, and for me, maybe the more conscious link to the Kantian aesthetic could be through structuralism. Uh, but in any hand, in this uh, particular work, I didn't refer it explicitly or consciously, neither to Kantian aesthetic, neither to structuralism. It was just what I found in the text. I tried to be, you know, um, I, I suppose everybody of us, there are young people here and less younger. Um, we, uh, in the beginning, were uh, so much uh, charged by a sort of, uh, of uh, a theoretical super ego that you try to <laughs> use more and more uh, theoretical references. And then the point comes when uh, you are full of them, and they just come out without controlling them. Uh, and, and in a more, and in this sense, I think they are more spontaneously used. Uh, and what is uh, imperative for me is to be closer to the text and try to be more faithful to Proust than, than to my theoretical background, which doesn't mean that I get rid of it, but it's infused in, in a more implicit way, I shall say. But you are right, there is a, a, a sort of a, a temps perdu, theoretical <laughs> temps perdu. <laughs> <laughs> so? Repulsion theorique, yes, exactly. Um, about stabilizing vertigo um, in the Madeline episode by stabilizing his vertigo, he starts us this series of images about Congrey, and he seems to be making it visible. But there also seems to be another stabilizing technique that renders objects invisible, like the tea becomes less and less effective every time he drinks it, and he notices it less. And like um, when the narrator moves to Baalbek and the hotel room is so disturbing at first, and then by habit it becomes you know, almost an extension of the I'll speak about this next time about the metaphor, yeah. Yeah, so are there two are they two different processes or um, I think there are two different processes and he combines them. Because if, if he was only in the metaphor, in the metonymic stabilization, it would be something very rigid. It would be a sort of, uh, of uh, graphic uh, painting. Uh, while if you compare the Proustian uh, universe to some uh, uh, pictorial universe, it would be more likely the impressionist one. And in this impressionist things, you have in the same time this vertigo, this destabilization, uh, the adjustment of contrast that uh, annihilate themselves. Uh, and that's what happens when he drinks the tea and when he, uh, he experiences the vertigo and he doesn't know what does it mean, etc. Uh, but uh, he doesn't want to remain only on this uh, 
irrational in a sense level. And so, so he's shifting all the time from one axe to, to, to another. I think so. And, and uh, even, even uh, the, the, most, uh, the most complicated, the most polyvalent metaphor is built up with these two uh, processes. There is always a kind of metonymy in, in, in the metaphor. There, there are very interesting, a little bit uh, too formalistic in this sense, on you. Uh, Boredom? Boredom. 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 Yeah, um, articles from Gérard Genet about metaphor and metonymy in Proust. But they are very, very clever and they describe this uh, bifold process in, in a very particular and uh, uh, I mean, uh, precise way, meticulous way. Oui, ce que euh, Christine venait là parce que je comprends pas tout, moi, je suis perdue. Oui. Yeah, it's it's uh, you are right. In the last pages, he explicit, explicitly invites the reader to do the same operation and to find the embodied time. He he had uh, that's why uh, his idea uh, that the book is a cathedral uh, goes very far. Uh, you remember maybe that when he uh, was young, he wrote an article um, in, in praising the cathedrals. Uh, and against this uh, uh, leftist and progressive tendency in France that wanted to close the cathedrals, to fermer les cathédrales, what do you call And the shadow, yeah. And the idea was uh, not only to maintain the cathedrals like museums, but uh, uh, let people go there, there. Uh, because not uh, so much of the experience of God, as I told you, he, he was an atheist, but because of this uh, intense aesthetic experience that they can have there through the text, through the images, etc. And uh, now I go back to the text. In the end of Le Temps Retrouvé, he asks, he asks the reader to uh, find in himself the same embodied experience. And he says that the book is not only a dead object, but it should be a, a sort of transubstantiation, um, a, a redefined object for the reader, and not only for the writer. He invites the writer to have the same process. And in this sense, when I said yesterday that he inaugurates modern aesthetics, I was thinking particularly uh, of, of those uh, uh, musical experiences, for instance, like Stockhausen and people like that, that invite people to in, uh, an improvisation. I'm a composer, I make uh, some piece of music, but now you take it and on my ground, on my schema, you, you have to improvise your own implication. There is something like that, uh, not so precisely and so clearly, uh, mentioned, but he invites the uh, relector uh, to, to to rediscover the embodied time. Um, I was really struck when you were describing um, near the end you said the oral collapse and the mother's proximity is contrasted or it, it is able to control it by the stability of that really only. Mm -hmm. You describe the sitting bourgeois ironically described as a ridiculous presence who provides an angel come away. And I was struck by how clearly that describes the priest himself. And I'm wondering whether the, the vertigo in the mother's presence um, is in a sense controlled. 
contrasted with his need to separate from her mm -hmm. and to consolidate himself as an individual and how to repeat it constantly throughout the world. Yeah. Seeking for an individual experience. He seems to tie in with what's going on with the reader at the end. You can't take my cathedral. You have to create the own mm -hmm. bodily temple. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you're right, he, he's always uh, split between this necessity to, uh, to go deeper and deeper in this vertigo, in this uh, uh, sort of contagion with the, the maternal shock, the maternal intrusion. And it's uh, uh, no question for him to, uh, to repress this, because if he's repressing such uh, kind of experience, He's, uh, he's just a sort of dry person. He's not able to create anything. But in the same time, this is too much. It creates asthma. It creates a sort of a, a very, very, very mm, too much sensitive man. And it, it, it's necessary to stabilize this also. So he try, tries to find uh, a counterpoint, a counter way. And, and so he's uh, always uh, shifting way between the two poles. Well, he, it's in, yeah, it's individual uh, in the sense that in this case it's a paroxystic, so much paroxystic. Uh, maybe you and R and me we are not so so paroxystic, but I think it's not individual. It has an universal connotation uh, because the logic. Uh, is universal. Uh, if you take away the paroxysm, the logic is the same. Okay. Um, it's a, like a parallel could be, to what, I, what I'm trying to figure out is, could you make a parallel between saying, yes, there's this sort of religious level of this universal application at the same time, this whole God, if you would call it that, and then on the other hand, you have this transubstantiation, which is an individual. Um, the that process, we all have to go for ourselves in order to create something, or to be created. We all have to attend to that individual moment. That's what we're seeking for ultimately. This individual process is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, close to, to the schizophrenic experience. I, I have in my book about Proust uh, a chapter that tried to, to develop the difference between the mystic experience, uh, the psychotic one, and the Proustian one. Because if you follow me, you can ask me why this transubstantiation, this, um, this plunging into the senses, into the vertigo, uh, this uh, transubstantiation, why is not, uh, why don't describe this uh, as a psychotic experience? As we know from Freud, uh, what characterizes psychotic is the equivalence between words and things. And in one sense, uh, when you follow the, uh, my commentary on the Madeleine, uh, the world, the Madeleine, becomes uh, a thing, which is uh, a sensitive thing, or the mother, so, no, some, something substantial become, becomes the equivalent of what is symbolic. And this is a particularly psychotic process. So what's the difference between this psychotic process and the Christian one? And you have um, something analogous in the mystical experience when uh, mystics also think that uh, what they experience on a hallucinatory uh, level is a reality. I see Virgin Mary, it's not uh, an image, but it's she, etc. Uh, well, uh, it, it will be too long to explain the, all the differences, but I have the impression that what differentiates radically truth from these two other experiences is the um, permanent awareness of the fact that he is creating this experience, that this is a creation of words, that this is imaginary. It's very... Uh, Joyce, how to say, jouissif. It's very intense. It's uh, it's a sort of vertigo. It's very uh, destabilizing. It's really uh, um, a, a bliss or whatever. But I created true words, and uh, this presence of the consciousness creating is uh, uh, it's really. 
the, the fact that uh, that uh, accompanies this process till the end of his writing. I was very interested by analyzing the last sentence of uh, Le Temps Retrouvé, uh, which is uh, in the last edition, a uh, not very long one, takes uh, about uh, 10 lines, or so, which is not very much for first. Uh, but uh, when you go back to, to the uh, previous versions, we fi you find uh, almost four pages. All of them are blocked from Barré, crossed out. And there are some words left. And apparently, the editors picked up the, what was more um, explicit and more easy. But if you tried to rebuild the whole process, you see that even till the end of his life, because he, he died a uh, day after and he was dying, it's visible how his uh, hand was quivering. Even on that level, he was a very, very clever and present and conscious, trying to gasp his mental process and to mm, refine the metaphors and use another word and change the metaphors and to be to be more exigent about his style, etc. So this uh, sort of, uh, how to say, craftsman even uh, ability is present till the end of his life, and in, which is not the case of, of, of the minor mystics, also maybe Saint Jean de la Croix had his, such kind of exigency, but minor mystics didn't have this, and of course it's not the fact. Um, in response to your uh, question, was there, can you say the psychoanalytic practice? First, the sort of, uh, sort of vouch for repression instead, and uh, allow for uh, kind of desire to see things that is that possible. And try to. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you just repeat that? Sure. Um, in response to the psychic mystic difference there, and what uh, sort of, uh, I can correct my own thought on this, was trying to maintain an irony, uh, an awareness, in spite of the big pull or love towards sort of collapsing the bar or whatever that was there. Now, what I'm trying to get at is, is he actually vouching for a repression? Is he actually, uh, Est-ce que c'était une sorte de refoulement? Mm -hmm. ça? Oui. I don't think so. You know, when you are in, this is a question I'll try to, to answer in my in a more in a more subjective way. Uh, uh, and I apologize for comparing myself to Proust. But uh, uh, when I try to speak about the experience I was involved in this uh, French structuralism and post-structuralism that I call the Samurai. The book is uh, now published in uh, American and it will be, uh, I suppose, in the stores uh, in some days. And I'll be there to speak about it in the public lecture. But uh, uh, I, uh, why I refer to this? Because when you try to uh, refer to an experience in which you were involved, you cannot refer to it directly. You have uh, all, uh, why? Because not only because you cannot say everything about people that are alive and there is a sort of privacy to be protected and uh, it's sort of elegance that is required, etc. This is uh, one thing. But also because uh, uh, some intensity of the emotional experience uh, cannot be expressed otherwise than through uh, rhetoric, through metaphors and metonymy. And this is uh, also what uh, linguistics teaches us. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, the fact that uh, uh, in the beginning was metaphor, in the beginning, the first word has already been a transformation of uh, the uh, uh, of the lost origin, the original, the authentic doesn't exist, uh, and, and I think that uh, doing this displacement through irony, through Tante Leonie, 
Proust is uh, unconsciously obeying this uh, psychic law. If you are uh, very uh, deeply involved in what is the pulsional, the instinctive truth, you cannot uh, translate it. You cannot communicate it. You are just, uh, um, I shall say, distracted in it, in a sort of abyss. The potional is, uh, is, our, is our hell. In order to get out of the hell, you have to, you have, you have to use rhetoric devices. Uh, there are always uh, distortions. I think so. He tried, uh, apparently, uh, in the first time, to uh, hidden his own, to hide his own uh, um, involvement with his mother uh, through reading, through her voice, through um, this uh, uh, nourishment that is evoked by the Madeleine. Uh, he tried to hide this. Uh, by evoking uh, the uh, Madame Blanchet and François de Champy. And finally, uh, he abandoned her because I think it is too pleasant, too uh, folklore looking. And also, growing up, uh, he, uh, she was, uh, Georges Chant was one of the favorite writers of his mother and grandmother. And when uh, he uh, built his own aesthetics, he uh, was aware of the fact that uh, uh, Georges Saint's aesthetics was not his own. Uh, and he erased every kind of references to her. And even in the letters, he says that uh, she's awful and she doesn't write very well, etc. cetera. And, uh, but finally, uh, the reference still remains not to Georges Sand explicitly, but, but to this François Le Champy. And even as I told in the beginning of my lecture, uh, we find again François Le Champy in the last pages, which means that, in my mind, what is permanent besides this rejection of Georges Sand's styles is the reference to the, to the incest, which is a sort of stabilization. It's not me, it's she. about this orality? And orality as I think it's very essential for proof for every one of us because uh, as uh, psychoanalytic experience uh, shows, this is the essential link that attaches child to mother and to the surrounding world. And there are different um, handicaps and uh, sicknesses and symptoms that occur on this oral uh, vector, I'll say. Well, uh, and, uh, for instance, different uh, uh, inhibitions on acquisition of language, uh, different, uh, and even asthma can be considered as a sort of accident on this link of the oral relationship with the mother. Uh, because it's too, too intense and uh, it's not only nourishment, but it's also what passes through, mouth, through the mouth, it's also air. There is a sort of uh, a mixture between nose, mouth, and everything that is um, uh, vital for the surviving of a small child. And this is uh, one of, of, of the essential basis, I think, of, of the Proust sensations. 